How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. Just a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. Well, hello, and welcome to Cinema Shock, the podcast that explores the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films. And I'm one of your hosts, Gary Horn. I'm co-host Justin Bishop, joined as always by Mr. Todd A. Davis. Hey, everybody. Hey, Todd. <laughs> Todd, that was so bland for such a big <laughs> I'm sorry. episode. I, I thought we were like just. I'm Gary just, Horn. I'm Justin Bishop. Here's I'm erect. Why aren't you erect, Todd? <laughs> <laughs> How do you? I mean, here's how do you know the, here's he's the not? Thing. I was gonna say, how do you know I'm not? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can only see him from the waist from the waist up here. Uh, True, just, it's just well, under my chin. It's just under Rub my some chin. ice right on now. them, Todd. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. Mm. <laughs> Todd's always doing. He's always rubbing his nipples anyway. So it's <laughs> just not ice. There's just not usually ice involved. So. <laughs> I've gotten. It's down to a science. I I know the technique. I know myself. <laughs> I know how to get myself off, guys. <laughs> Well, what a start to this show. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everybody. <laughs> so this is honestly, uh, this is the, this episode is the whole reason we're, we're doing a Paul Verhoeven series. I, you guys, <laughs> I may not have disclosed that to the two of you when we planned this, uh, but this is a big part of why I wanted to do this series. I mean, obviously we had talked about RoboCop on the old show and obviously everybody as everybody is familiar with and knows what they think about Total Recall, but this is one that like, People are still trying to figure out and still discussing it in full, you know, 25 years later, 26 well, years now. Wasn't this like from not just the old show, but like the first show, wasn't this kind of on the radar? To this has talk? always just, been on the radar. Just yes. because, yeah, just because of its <laughs> cult status. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if anything's a cult movie, this is a cult movie. So, oh, yeah. So here we are. We're, you know, we're, we're what, five episodes in on Paul Verhoeven, right? Mm-hmm. And this is like, for some reason, the movie of his, I don't know if it's the one that gets discussed the most, but it's the one that gets, I'd say, debated the most. You yeah, know? I think so. Would you yeah. agree with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think because, I mean, you know, Starship Troopers obviously was, you know, pretty popular, successful. There's yeah. discussion to be had there. Robocop, Absolutely. of course, is the big, you know, juggernaut of a you know franchise starter there. But yeah, I feel like this is kind of the one where it's just, let's discuss this. Well, because mo- most of them, there's like a consensus on what people think about it. You know, right, like pe- right. everyone likes RoboCop and pretty much everyone likes Total Recall and Basic Instinct and Starship Troopers. Pretty much yeah. everyone dislikes a hollow man. Uh, but this is one that it's the discussion and the, the opinions on it are all over the place. Mm. So, you know, at this point, if you've been keeping up with this series... Uh, you already know this, but at this point in his career, you know, Paul Verhoeven had more than proven himself to be a serious A-list director. He had had already three major hits in a row. And I mean, like, not moderate hits, like huge, huge ones. movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, each one bigger than the last. And with that much success comes a lot of clout. So for his next film, he cashed in on that clout to do something that was truly audacious. Uh, he wanted to direct a major movie that wouldn't have to be cut to get an R rating, which is something that, as we've discussed, he'd battled with on all of his American productions so far. And the resulting film is the most infamous film of Verhoeven's career. It was a box office bomb upon release. It was derided by critics. It's often called one of the worst films ever made. But in recent years, it's fascinating because this film has been reevaluated by both critics and audiences alike. And although it still kind of maintains a reputation as a so bad, it's good film, uh, it's gone on to become a modern day cult classic and is probably more popular now over a quarter of a century since its release mm. than it's ever been before. Uh, you guys, of course, know what we're talking about today. We're talking about Showgirls. So what are you going to Vegas for? You going to win? I'm going to dance. There's a spot open in the chorus line. I think you should try out. I got an audition! 
Okay, ladies, I got one interest here, and that's the show. I don't care whether you live or die. I want to see you dance, and I want to see you smile. From the creators of Basic Instinct, the last time they took you to the edge, this time they're taking you all the way. We take the cash, we cash the check, we show them what they want to see. It's not about fair, it's about power. You're a stripper, don't you get it? I'm a dancer. She's dazzling, she's exciting, and she's what Las Vegas is all about. Showgirls. Leave your inhibitions at the door. So the story of this is, is pretty interesting. The one day over lunch, Paul Verhoeven went to, he, he patched things up with Joe Esterhaus. Remember Joe Esterhaus, the writer of basic instinct. And they had that riff over the direction that the movie was going. So they kind of put that aside after the movie made a shit ton of money. They put that aside and decided maybe we want to patch this up because we might want to work together a mi- again and see if lightning will strike twice. So they had lunch and they started t- chatting and the subject soon came around to these, the big MGM musicals that they both loved when they were younger. Like I'm talking musicals from the like thirties and forties. A lot of these pre-code musicals, these Busby Berkeley musicals. In the course of this conversation, Verhoeven confessed that he'd always wanted to make a musical, but not the old fashioned kind. Uh, just as he'd updated the Hitchcockian thriller for the nineties with basic instinct, he kind of wanted to do the same with these Busby Berkeley style musicals. And Esther House suggested that they set the film in present day Las Vegas. Dig that. I mean, it's, it is definitely, I think if you look at, well, I mean, Gary can probably speak to this better than I can, but I beat him to the punch. I th- feel like the start of this does lend itself very well to the structure of classic musicals. Wouldn't you yeah. say, Gary? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, I mean, Verhoeven straight up in interviews later calls it as MGM musical or something like that. So yeah. <laughs> he's, he's well, definitely for it. It's a girl who's she's coming to town wanting to make it big. And she's got dreams of stardom. Like it's not the most original character arc or plot arc, you know, but neither were those musicals that they were kind of riffing on, you know, uh, it was all about the spectacle in those musicals, not mm-hmm. necessarily a, an original story. Esther House was paid in advance of $2 million based on his idea for this, which is an idea that he scribbled on a screenplay or excuse me, scribbled on a napkin. It wasn't even a screenplay. It wasn't even a spec script. He scribbled it on a napkin, got $2 million based on it with an additional 1.7 million once the studio produced it. And that was a deal that along with his fees on basic instinct and sliver actually made him the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood history. Take, that so, Jane, uh, Black. <laughs> yeah. Shane Black, you piece Shane. of shit. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, Shane Black's like living with his three buddies in the house, you know, and like trying to sort all that stuff out. I guess he's having the parties probably at this. Yeah, this is around party, party central for Shane Black right here. <laughs> but for some reason, the world was such a place where Joe Esterhaus was sitting at his Maui home and just scribbled some bullshit on a napkin and somebody gave him $2 million <laughs> for it. And then Ugh. promised him another almost two million more, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, oh, and here, here's a fun little side note. Uh, so, this wasn't actually Verhoeven's planned follow-up to Basic Instinct. Not initially, uh, after Esther House had sold the rights to, or had sold the actual script, the Showgirls script, but before the film was was greenlit to start filming, another project suddenly came up. It was a film called Crusade, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, the movie was written. This Crusade movie was written by uh, Waylon Green. He's the guy we talked about. He had written The Wild Bunch and had contributed to rewrites on RoboCop and RoboCop 2. Uh, And it was a movie. The story was to be set during the the Crusades, uh, which would have been pretty fascinating. It was uh, because we've we've talked about how Verhoeven is sort of obsessed with Christianity and Christian history. Now, this this was not going to be like a a pro Crusades uh, (laughs) view of things. I mean, the Christians in the movie were going to be seen as essentially the bad guys, these guys who were just out murdering Jews and Muslims because that's what the Crusades were. (laughs) So, and Paul Verhoeven had every plan to show it in every gory detail. I mean, it was going to be this big, expensive, violent, epic action movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger as like this uh, this guy who goes out to 
to he's a soldier in the crusades and has a change of heart and all this anyway you can find the information about this online you can find a full plot synopsis it's really one of those like interesting i wish we could have seen what had happened so it never uh, it never saw the light of day it never saw the light of day they got all the way into oh, pre-production man. uh they it were sounds, built- it sounds dope <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they, they didn't do any kind of screen test or anything they were they got as far as building set they were building these sets this reproduction of jerusalem in spain but then Corolco, remember these guys who uh, Verhoeven had made some movies with before uh, they had some financing issues you see they, they had spent a lot of money uh, they had sunk a lot of money mm. into Cutthroat Island remember Cutthroat Island oh, that disastrous yeah. movie directed by Rennie Harlan we talked a little bit about this back in our Shane Black series around Christmas when we talked about Long Kiss Goodnight yeah. but Cutthroat Island uh, if you don't know the history was a major financial disaster it was a hugely expensive movie for the time and it essentially was the the coffin in, in uh, Corolco and it definitely killed this movie. Like it <laughs> killed Crusade. So Crusade never happened mm. uh, as a result. But that was actually it, Verhoeven wasn't planning on going like with an erotic thriller followed by Showgirls. He right. was planning on going back to almost back to like flesh and blood type of uh, period piece actually, mm. but with a bigger budget and more resources than he had before. I was going to say, and it sounds like maybe even more substance. Like that well, sounds like a really deep plot. Or, yeah. It really does. Yeah, it sounds lucky for us. He landed the gig with his ultimate Christ figure. <laughs> no me, <laughs> no me, Malone. <laughs> but so anyway, Verhoeven and Esther House, you know, they they're they're working on Showgirls. They spent a few weeks uh, going to Vegas, uh, weeks and weeks going to Vegas. They were talking to everyone they could in in the industry, showgirls, choreographers, strippers. They interviewed like thirty or forty people and helped kind of use those conversations to help shape the film on the strength of his previous successes uh, paul verhoven was able and this is insane to think about but he was able to get pre-approval in his contract with mgm and united artists to make an nc-17 rated movie Uh, that was a move that made him the first director in the history of the medium to be given that kind of no holds barred freedom by a major hollywood studio Uh, like he he went into this going there's no way I can cut this to an R rating uh, if we make the movie that is in the script. So he was able to get them to agree to that, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's nuts. I mean, when you think about ho- big Hollywood studios, what do they make? Oh, they make movies. No, they make money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the ratings basically dictate how much money you can make, Yeah, you know, give or take. But yeah, that's that's huge. That is a huge deal. Part of how he was able to get them to uh, to agree to that is that in return for complete creative control and the right to final cut, Verhoeven agreed to defer 70% of his $6 million director's fee until the time when or if the film turned a profit. So his assumption or his kind of thinking on that was that you know, he figures if the studio was taking this big of a gamble, then he should be willing to share the risk, which is admirable i think i mean this was a huge gamble for the studio hey you Uh, gotta gamble if you want to win yeah yeah so and to realize just how big of a deal this was i want to talk a little bit about the nc-17 rating uh because there's a lot of history about this uh there's a lot of history in general when it comes to the rating system in america so i'm only going to give a brief overview because there are books and documentaries uh, countless resources where you've, if you want to read the entire history of the, the rating system going back to the Hayes code days and the pre code days. And it's fascinating. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's a fascinating look at the history of, of America in general and censorship in America, uh, but through the prism of movies. But the most important uh, thing to know is the NC-17 movies are typically the ones that were behind the curtain in the video store that Justin's mom was in. <laughs> My mom worked at the video store. <laughs> Ah, I like what you did there. That's good. <laughs> so here's the Cliff Notes version of the history of the rating system. So the, the rating system was put into place by the Motion Picture Association of America. Uh, that took effect in 1968. Uh, Jack Valenti was the president of the MPAA at the time. And those ratings were G, rated G for films that were suggested for general audiences. M for films that were suggested for mature audiences or with parental discretion advised R for restricted films, which meant that persons under the age of 16 were not admitted unless accompanied by a parent or legal guardian. And then X, which meant that no one under the age of 16 was allowed to be admitted. 
Now, the X rating, the X rating was not actually originally part of the MPAA's plan, but they were urged by the National Association of Theater Owners to create an adults only category because they were worried about possible legal problems in regards to obscenity charges in some local jurisdictions. Because this was a time where if you, a time in America where if you showed a movie that was considered obscene, you could go to jail in certain parts of the country. Hell, some comedians were being arrested for the content of their of their material. Lenny Bruce. Yeah. So as a result, the X rating, you know, was created, but it was not an MPAA trademark and wouldn't receive any movie that had that would not receive it. The MPAA seal. So basically any film producer who wasn't submitting a film for MPAA rating could self apply the X rating to their film. So it didn't have to go through the board to get an X rating. You could just say, Hey, this is an X rated movie, slap a sticker on it and you're good to go. Nice. So the first film, that officially received an X rating was Jack Cardiff's The Girl on a Motorcycle. And then by 1970, they started making some changes. Uh, the changes, the, the ages for R and X rated films were changed to 17. And over the years, a handful of other changes to the rating system took place. Like they, they changed the M rating to GP uh, and then GP was changed to PG, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we got the PG 13 rating down the line in like 1986, but, in the early days of the rating system, X-rated films were understood to be unsuitable for children, but non-pornographic and intended for general public. Uh, and, and some examples of the types of movies that would be given an X rating were critically acclaimed films like Midnight Cowboy, which won an Oscar, or, or Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Like these are serious, this is serious cinema that's getting this. They're just movies that should only be viewed by adults. But since the X rating had not been trademarked by the NPAA, pornographic films would often self-apply the X ratings to their films. And eventually the rating just became synonymous with pornography. And eventually it morphed into double X and triple X and all this stuff. But that, that's where it began. Simple lack of trademark. So in late 1989, early 1990, there were a couple of critically acclaimed independent films that featured strong adult content uh, that came out. One was Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. And one was The, the Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover. Both very well regarded films. Uh, but neither film was approved for an MPAA rating, which what happens is it limits their commercial distribution. There are certain places that won't play it if it doesn't have an MPAA rating on it, which uh, and that led, we, we talked about this a little bit back in um, our George Romero series with Dawn of the Dead, which they chose to release without going through the MPAA, without an MPAA rating. And while that movie did well, like it, there were places that it was not allowed to be played in America. What happens after Henry and, and the cook, the thief, his wife and her lover come out is the MPAA starts getting a lot of criticism over its lack of a designation for these types of movies, movies that are intended for adults that aren't quote unquote adult films. So in September of 1990, the MPAA introduced a new rating, one what, that was created to distinguish serious adult films from pornography. And that was the NC-17, which stands for No Children Under 17 Admitted. Uh, so unlike an R rating where you can get in with a you know parent or legal guardian in an NC-17 movie, that's not happening. Like you have to be over 17 to see it. So the first film to receive that rating was Philip Kaufman's Henry and June, which was a film that had previously received the X rating from the MPAA, but only 100 theaters agreed to screen the film. Uh, so there was still this stigma on it and that led to it being a financial failure. And although... You know, NC-17 movies, they had more mainstream distribution opportunities in X films. A lot of theaters still refused to screen them, and most media outlets wouldn't advertise them. And a lot of large video chains, especially Blockbuster, refused to stock them on their shelves. So when we say that Paul Verhoeven has talked MG MGM into financing a $38 million guaranteed NC-17 movie, that's a big deal. That's a major risk for everyone involved, but especially the people who are paying the $38 million to make the movie. Oh yeah. Cause I mean, they clearly see it as an investment. I mean, in, in every aspect, but yeah, that's a huge deal. 
And it wasn't as if Verhoeven decides he's going to add stuff to the movie to make sure it's NC-17. He just didn't want to cut anything. If they put it, gave it to the MPAA and they gave him an R rating, they'd go with an R rating. You right. know? But it wasn't like he was intentionally adding stuff going, oh, we got to make this even even more depraved and more add more sex, add more violence. Let's add, we, we've got to get that NC-17. It wasn't right. like that. Uh, it <laughs> right. was just he, he contractually did not have to make sure that it was R rated. I have a question here. What if, so if there were movies out there and this may be like completely out of left field and and I don't know that you ran across this in your research, but maybe this is just something in my mind. I know how like some movies, I mean, you see it more nowadays, but I wonder if there was a movie that was given an X rating that was later reevaluated and given a lesser rating. Did anybody reissue their movie into theaters to try to get the grosses up. You know, I, I don't know that anyone reissued. I know that movies have been reevaluated mm. by the MPAA, but I, I don't have any examples off the top of my head. Okay. I was just wondering about that. Cause I was like, I mean, if, if I were a filmmaker in that time and I had gotten the one thing, you know, five, 10, 20 years later, whatever, yeah, it gets reevaluated and the ratings drop. I'm mean, like, hey, what do we think about a anniversary re-release and see if we can get the grosses? Yeah, up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there there are movies that have been re-rated later on, like that were maybe you know maybe they came out before before like the NC-17 rating existed or etc. You know, things have changed with the MPAA so much over the years, right? That it's kind of hard to say because you know there are movies that were originally rated NC-17 or rated X that were appealed or resubmitted to the NPA prior to release as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, you know, American pie uh, or as one, right. or, you know, I think, I think even clerks may have gotten like an X rating or an NC-17 rating initially just for language yeah, before being so. resubmitted, you know, uh, but again, I'd have to really look into that, but yeah, I would say that, that uh, there are are some well i mentioned one earlier midnight cowboy uh, midnight cowboy got an x rating now i don't know if, if it was ever reissued but it got an x rating upon original release but now if you if you were to look up at, at midnight cowboy on any like streaming service or a blu-ray or something right now it's got an r rating you know right i did want to say here just for the record i was going to save this for later but it actually fits in because todd mentioned comedy too and just these things playing out and it made me think of this quote i saw from uh bill hicks and uh, this is from 1992. <laughs> it was it was so funny to me as I was doing research. He uh, he is apparently not a fan of Joe Esterhaus, uh, as you'll see here. But he was talking <laughs> in a bit about uh, comedy and porno and all of this stuff and what pornography is in the uh, in the U.S. But anyway, I keep saying that. He says, uh, "I wish they would just go ahead and combine video and porno." He's like, look at Joe Esterhaus screenplays, flash dance, young girl shows titties. Fucking brilliant, Joe. Can we give you a million dollars for that? That's so fucking brilliant. Genius. But can you top yourself in basic instinct? Yeah. Young girl shows pussy. He's a genius. <laughs> give him $3 million for that. Now we'll give you $6 million. He's like, this is what's coming. We'll give you $6 million if you can top yourself. All right. Young girl shows titties and pussy. <laughs> Man, he's a fucking genius. And sadly, uh, and then he, and he goes on to say, he says, I would just prefer that people watched porno instead of paying for this Hollywood titillation horse shit that comes out supposedly for adults. Save paying Joe Esterhaus any more money for these scripts, that fat, no talent fucking whale who needs to die in front of his children on the kitchen floor with a blood bubble coming out of his left nostril. <laughs> wow. Tell us how you really feel, Bill. <laughs> anyway, the, Bill Hicks died in 1994, so he did not live long enough to see in 1995 that his prophecy was fulfilled. It's pretty close. (laughs) It wasn't quite six million, but it was four. (laughs) So it was pretty damn close. (laughs) Uh, Man. So anyway, we're we're at the point where the movie's been greenlit. We're ready to roll on this. They got to get a cast and a a long list of. Let's find some people to take the clothes off. Here we go. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And there were a long list of actresses that were considered for the lead role of Nomi Malone. Alone. Uh, that list included Pamela Anderson, Drew Barrymore, Angelina Jolie, Jenny McCarthy, Denise Richards, and Charlize Theron. Uh, but they all turned it down or didn't get the part for one reason or another. It's funny because all of them are like people who, let's say, are known for 
not being shy about what yeah. they show on screen. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that was the thinking at the time, but as I read that list, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Charlize Theron, apparently, according to Verhoeven, his re- he said that she almost got the part and she was like, you had no problems with the nudity or anything, but she was not considered well-known enough at the time, which is weird considering that the role ended up going to a, a fairly unknown actress, a 21-year-old Elizabeth Berkeley, who I say fairly unknown. Verhoeven claims that he didn't know who she was, that he, he had no idea of her history, which makes the thing where he says that Charlize was not well-known enough uh, a little suspect. But uh, again, this is him in interviews now talking about something that happened 25 years ago. But of course, guys our age, people our age, no, Elizabeth Berkeley for her performance as Jesse Spano, uh, who she played on Say by the Bell from 1989 to 1993. Uh, she, I mean, I, I don't know, I can't speak for you guys, I guess, but I grew up watching Say by the Bell, you know, and Jesse Spano was like the straight A good kid, yeah, feminist, you know, <laughs> she was the one that's all it was always. Uh, picketing against chauvinism and calling you know except for that one episode when she you know gets addicted to caffeine pills and sings i'm so excited i'm so excited freaks the fuck out which we didn't know at the time is her actual natural state but that was also (laughs) just jesse spano she was an overachiever and she was taking on too much yeah Uh, (laughs) <laughs> that was her way of, of trying to cope with that. It wasn't a good way to cope with it. Ca- taking caffeine pills. Are caffeine pills a thing? Is that a thing people take? Oh, yeah. 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 I don't yeah. know how addicted you can get I to them. I suppose coffee. you can. I think it was supposed to be like, you know, uh, an analogy. to Yeah, like, of course. Of like yeah. real like real drugs. Right. <laughs> but like actual. They were like, eh, cracks a little hardcore for Saved <laughs> yeah. by the Bell. For, for Saturday morning on NBC. <laughs> it cracked might be a little much. <laughs> she had time uh, out. I need to score some meth. I don't know. I just pictured, <laughs> I just pictured Zach Morris. Zach, <laughs> um, Zach Morris would would try to do that. Zach Morris would be a drug dealer in a real in a real high school. You know he would. <laughs> right, he probably would. So after the cancellation of uh, Say by the Bell, this you know Elizabeth Berkeley, this young actress, she has this ambition to break into Hollywood, and what better way than starring in a film from an acclaimed director who had had three smash hits? Uh, and this is a film that could not only boost your career but could also completely reverse the audience perception of who you are. And it makes a lot of sense why she would want to take this role because you see this a lot now. You've got all of, all these former Disney Channel stars that after they're, you know, they get a little bit older, they in, take on these intentionally provocative and sexualized roles in an attempt to break free from their reputations as stars of TV shows made for kids. And oh, we see yeah. this with like, uh, what's her name? Selena, Selena Gomez, like being in Spring Breakers, you know, uh, Lindsay Lohan did it. Yep. Uh, and like, it, it's pretty common these days. It's almost Lindsay like Lohan a- turned her life into Nomi's life. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> She modeled herself after Showgirls, her whole career. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it, it makes sense what elizabeth berkeley would try to do why she's trying to do this why she would want to do a movie like this as a follow-up to something like say by the bell she's trying to leave that character of jesse spano behind by playing something that is like the polar opposite of that character right and that and that type of career move or behavior wasn't just restricted to the to the ladies it, the fellas did it too yeah um you know that that list is just as long <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you just see it a little bit more with ladies it, it, because yeah. unfortunately that means uh, more sexualized roles because there yeah. are more sexualized roles that are created for women than for yeah, men. Exactly. They, they usually take advantage of it. it feel, I mean, like, you, you know, like every story you hear about Verhoeven, I mean, he's asking people to take their top off, like right there in the audition, go ahead and uh, strip down. Like Jennifer Lopez, I think was what I saw that was like, said she had auditioned and they asked her to take her top off. And wow, she, they recreated that right there in the film. Yeah. <laughs> I'm creating a topless show, ladies. Show me your tits. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Elizabeth Berkeley's pretty desperate for this role. She she aggressively pursued the part. She even called producer Charles Evans before casting had even begun and introduced herself on the phone as Nomi from Showgirls. Like she was confident. She was like, I'm going to get this role. She walked into Verhoeven's law office later on when, when she was able to be seen. And she told him, she said, there's no one else who can play this role, so you might as well stop looking. Uh, yes. You got to admire. You got to admire that, honestly. 
And then Tom Savini came in and did a somersault. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. A good throwback, Todd. Thanks. Good, good callback. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it wasn't lost on Elizabeth Berkeley that there were parallels between her and the character of Nomi. These were both girls looking for their big break. Uh, you know, Berkeley had, she had recently lost out on some other roles that she had tried to get that would end up going to Winona Ryder and Uma Thurman. But she really felt that Showgirls could make her a star just as Basic Instinct had done for Sharon Stone. Because Basic Instinct ma- pulled Sharon Stone from obscurity and made her one of the most famous people in the world. Yeah. Anyway, she gets the part. We know the history. She gets the part. Then for the role of Crystal Connors, which, you know, Nomi's rival, uh, actresses who were considered included Madonna, Sharon Stone, Sean Young, Daryl Hannah, and the part ultimately went to Gina Gershon. Now, now Gina Gershon was uh, older than Elizabeth Berkeley, as her character is as well. She's about 31, 32 at this time. Uh, and she was also, this was kind of supposed to be a big break for her too, because she had done a lot of like small parts, bit parts or, or parts where she just played like eye candy in a movie, but not like a real meaty role. So she was kind of like, this was a big deal for Gina Gershon as well. Yeah. A lot of people predicted, I don't know. I saw several interviews where like people actually compared her to like Angelina Jolie, like yeah. that she could have had that like career path and this movie after and they. Well, yeah, yeah. I said did a lot of people. Uh, but the, the cast, of course, was rounded out by, we've got Kyle McLaughlin, you know, which is, this is a very different part for him as well. Uh, he played Zach Carey. He had Glenn Plummer as James Smith, Robert Davi as Al, who is, we, you know, Robert Davi is a great character actor. I do have a question for Todd since yeah. we're talking about the cast. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you, in your, in your research, because you don't do... The, oh, uh, the, the background research, but you've got a very <laughs> important research project every week now. There's, there's at least one thing I do, <laughs> and I do it better than anybody, guys. <laughs> so tell I, me, Todd. I, I find out if any of these people have been on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. So what did you find? Not a lot. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, the young young lady uh, named uh, Gina Rivera, she plays Molly. Yeah, Molly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Who Nomi ends up staying with when she gets to Vegas. Uh, she was in one episode of Star Trek The Next Generation back in oh, 1993. Yeah. It was season seven, episode six, Phantasms. She played Ensign Tyler, right. which fairly uneventful. But the big cherry on that little thing is that it was directed by Patrick Stewart. So that's oh, kind of cool. Nice. Cool. But that's everybody that was in Star Trek. Good old uh, Molly. Dude, just you like got to do the, the song again. Yeah. You got to do your song. Uh and that's everybody on Star Trek. And that's you know, everybody on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that, you, you started that, and you have to do it every week now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Molly. She was like the best person in, yeah. in the whole movie. She's the only decent person in the whole yes. movie. <laughs> which is why she gets gag raped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a Paul Verhoeven movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so... MGM knew that they were going to have to pretty aggressively market this film in order for it to be successful. This is, after all, a $38 million film with a limited market due to its NC-17 rating. And $38 million is, in 1995, a pretty big budget for especially a character-based, essentially a a character-based drama. So the marketing campaign began with this teaser trailer that advertise it and it's one of those teaser trailers where it's all they don't really do this anymore but it's all just text on a screen you know and it's this text on the screen that says it, it advertises the movie as a movie so erotic so dangerous so controversial that we can't show you a thing that's the text on the screen like throughout as you hear like music oh, and wow. then it ends with just a single image of elizabeth berkeley like in her first strip that we see in the in the movie where she's licking the pole you know Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's all you see that's the only footage in it (laughs) which is like which the worst move especially in these days that's like the the one thing i don't want to see in my striptease act please don't don't give yourself coronavirus please don't put your tongue (laughs) on that (laughs) to be fair if you walk into uh las vegas proper to this day and take a deep breath you immediately have covid (laughs) So let alone, let I think alone the all the doorknob shot, and pole licking. I think the one shot should have been Molly punching her in the face and her throwing up. That should have been the scene. Uh, Man, I don't know. 
uh, we'll talk about this movie in a minute, but in the, in the movie, uh, the documentary, You Don't Know Me, there is a montage of footage of people throwing up in Paul Verhoeven movies. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. There's a lot of, there's a lot of vomit there's in so Paul many. Verhoeven. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. No, I, to, to give credit where it's due, if you haven't yet on the Blu-ray, there is a, uh, there's a commentary track by this guy named David Schmader. Yeah. Who, uh, toured showing this movie and just like basically riff track, like riff tracks i think he would pause it and then like talk about it he would talk about yeah similar the (laughs) annotated screenings but he got a call from these guys that he said he thought that it was just to be like a cease and desist but they actually asked him to come in and do the commentary track for it and so he talks to you throughout the movie and he is it's fantastic it's it's really fun (laughs) it's really fun (laughs) but yeah like right there in the first six minutes he's just like in the first six minutes of this movie Two near car crashes, a fortune, one and lost, and a cat fight where one punches one woman punches another and makes her vomit. <laughs> <laughs> that that teaser trailer was how they started the campaign. And then the later trailers for the film would kind of play it up as another steamy movie from the writing directing duo behind Basic Instinct. Uh, they plastered the now iconic poster, you know, of Elizabeth Berkeley of the you know the leg and everything. It's a great mm. poster, honestly. It's a great poster for this movie. But they they plastered that thing on airplanes, taxis, buses, bus stops, billboards. Uh, you know, they're pe- pe- uh, excuse me, they're plastering it along Times Square on Sunset Boulevard. Like they are really, you could not escape Showgirls in 1995. Mm. Uh, they distributed. They also did this. This is like a week or two before the movie came out. They distributed 250 thousand copies of a promotional video trailer that had sexy scenes from the movie to video stores, not Blockbuster though, but to other video stores where you could just rent it for free as like a promotional device. You could watch this 11 minute video of like a compilation of nudity and stuff from the movie, which to me, it's like for people who are only going to see the nudity, like you just gave them that shit for free. I was going to (laughs) say 11 minutes is really more than anybody really needs. It's a lot. (laughs) You got to keep that at like two. Yeah, just yeah. enough to like get you there. <laughs> like when you're when you're doing it yourself, just enough yeah. to like just enough to piss you off, just enough to make you want more. <laughs> <laughs> and th- there was this. There was also a special showgirls website set up. Now remember, this is 1995, very early days of the internet. So like movie promotional websites weren't just a thing like they are now, or like they later would become. So and on this website, the showgirls website, you could view uh, nude photos from the film and chat with Elizabeth Berkeley about the film. Now, I don't know if it was a real chat, if it was like a weird automated thing, I don't know, but uh, and then Berkeley, she appeared, she was doing her promotional rounds for her. She appeared on late night with David Letterman to demonstrate the art of lap dancing. This is how they're promoting this. Ooh, isn't that, it's really crazy. And they also put out this, a book called showgirls portrait of a film. And I tried to find it. Uh, I mean, I found it for sale, but it is, hundreds of dollars now is this the coffee table um, book the coffee table book yeah they talk about it and you don't know me a, a good bit but yeah it's, it's this a book. Coffee table book it's a book <laughs> that's like <laughs> it's like and this is before the movie came out but it's, it's a bunch of essays by uh by verhoven talking about the movie and his intentions in the movie and all this and like very intellectual and beautiful photographs from like not and not just like scenes from the movie but like a, a, actual photo shoots of the actors and things like that. And I wanted yeah. it. I wanted it so bad. Yeah. I, I want <laughs> uh, it is, the commentary it is, talks about it a little bit too. He's yeah. just like watching. He's like, you may question a lot. He's like, but he's like, I used to think I knew uh what Verhoeven was thinking. He's like, but then you yeah, he's like, you you get that coffee table book and it's like you get some essays and it's like serious. He's yeah, like it's very real serious. shit. He is yeah. talking about showgirls as his MGM musical with its Christian overtones and multiple layers of reality. He's like, yeah. it's fucking fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and if if anyone ever finds this book out in the wild, I'll just say at me because <laughs> I want it. And I don't want to pay eBay prices for it. Uh, because it is going for four to five hundred dollars on eBay for a paperback. If you find a hardback, it's a cool grand for Oof. that book. Jeez. Uh, so now I'm going to like just hunt every used bookstore I can find every time I go in. And I'm going to hope that this cross my fingers and hope that this book is there. So, but as you can tell, I mean, this marketing that they're doing, most of it is focused on the film's sexual content. Like MGM knew, or at least hoped 
that sex would sell the movie to audiences. They thought this is what this is why people are going to buy a ticket. Well, now, sure. Joe Esterhaus, on the other hand, <laughs> promoted this as a as a morality tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually took a full page ad out in Variety, and I'm going to read his a quote from his ad that said. Quote, the movie shows that dancers in Vegas are often victimized, humiliated, used verbally and physically raped by the men who are at, po- at the power centers of that world. The advertising people have devised the tagline, leave your inhibitions at the door to sell a movie, which is about a young woman who leaves her ambitions at the door to save her soul. I implore you to not let misguided fast bug advertising influence your feelings about showgirls. So he's like basically trying to tell people, this is not the movie that MGM is trying to sell you. This is a serious film with a serious story. And he would also say in interviews, this is another quote from him. It's a chauvinistic position to advertise showgirls on the sports page because of its more sensational aspects. I want young women to see this movie because young women will respond to this movie in the same way that they responded to flash dance. And he even went on in these interviews to encourage women under the age of 17 to use fake IDs so that they could get into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. It's like Esther House, uh, no, he he doesn't know women. I don't think. Like, I don't think he knows other women. Um, I think he's met. I think he's met women. There's an he, idea he, of women. I think he's met women, and he's he's had girlfriends or wives, maybe. He's and just he, made they, up his old and thing. He, he he has latched onto little things that the, that women he knows has has done, uh, and thinks that that's something that every woman. That's how every woman acts. Like all women want to talk about are their nails. Again, referring, I was about to say, again, referring back to that commentary, commentary he, he, he says it in there that, like, uh, apparently his idea is that all women do when they're alone is discuss chips and their nails. <laughs> he says, sometimes this is expanded, that if they go outside of this, it's including Mexican food, like mm-hmm. burritos and fajitas, which is literally a line, like, in the movie. She's like, I'm going to take you to buy, buy you a burrito and fajitas. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like... Or they discuss their old breasts. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, that's that's what he knows about women. Yeah. It's, it's, it, w- women either want to discuss being, they want to be naked or they want to talk about being naked. That's what he thinks. <laughs> right. That's what Joe Esserhaus <laughs> thinks. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. he's a, it's an interesting dude. But anyway, so they, they're doing all this insane advertising, insane marketing. And this multifaceted approach to marketing actually did help the film to break through that ban that most publications had for advertising an NC-17 movie. Uh, You know, there's a lot of talk about this movie. There's a lot of interviews about it. There's a lot of awareness of this movie before it came out, which raised high hopes for the film's box office. Uh, Ads ran in most markets uh, with only some newspapers in the Bible Belt and one network, NBC, uh, deciding not to advertise the film, but pretty much every other major publication and major network was advertising this film. So things are looking like it's going to do well. I would just like to also say the irony of all of what you're saying, interestingly enough, it, it just hit me, is that there are lots of interviews and lots of discussion about this movie, but nothing truly informative. Just exactly what you'd think is kind of how it is. Like they're <laughs> they're pretty just transparent about everything in this movie. Yeah. And also, it just hit me that, ironically, we're, I'm making fun of Joe Esterhaus, but this movie would probably pass that Bechdel test. Oh, just because, <laughs> of, the, just because of the doggy chow scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, of all movies, this one would probably get by. <laughs> technically, the movie passes the Bechdel test because of the doggy chow scene. Yeah. So uh, for those who don't remember, it's like uh, it's like uh, two, two women have a conversation with each other that is not about... Or it's about something other than another man or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the film opens in 1,388 theaters, nearly as many as Basic Instinct, with only two theater uh, chains uh, based here, of course, in the South, uh, who refused to show the film. So it seemed like MGM's big gamble was about to pay off. But unfortunately, <laughs> things did not quite work out the way that they and, wanted it to. And then people saw it. <laughs> no, it wasn't even that. People didn't see it. That's well, the thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, it, I mean, critics saw it. Yes. Uh, so Showgirls was released in September of 1995, and it took a beating from critics. Uh, Jack Matthews of Newsday called it the worst movie in 1995. He said, quote, it, it, he said that it was, quote, something a high school senior would be embarrassed to submit to Penthouse. Uh, Variety said. This is going to make this really hard to do our next segment, Gary, because I don't know if anyone's going to do better than these <laughs> professional critics this. on this one. <laughs> it's too many. Too many. Uh, Variety said, quote, the only positive thing there is to say about Showgirls is that the sensibility of the film perfectly matches that of its milieu, impossibly vulgar, tawdry, and coarse. Richard Corliss of Time said that the film was one of those hilarious botches that could be taught in film schools as a how not to. And taking a large brunt of the criticism for the film was the film star, Elizabeth Berkley. Uh, she received some of, honestly, she received some of the most cruel reviews that an aspiring actress has ever received. Uh, like, like very mean, mean stuff, like personal stuff. Uh, she was described as having, uh, this is a quote, the non-personality and permanently gaping mouth of an inflatable doll. One critic said that Showgirls requires that Berkeley spend at least half her time topless, and it could be argued in the interest of not purience, but of pure dramatic method, that her breasts are more expressive than her face. Oops. That's fucking mean. That's, I mean, God. regardless of what you think of an actress's performance, like to say that you're that she she's acting that her breasts are better actors than she is, like that's fucked up. Yeah, yeah, that's. Ugh. It wow. is it is rough. And, and she even said, like, ever since the reviews for Showgirls came out, I saw like one interview where there were she said it's like I was the woman in the scarlet letter. Yeah. Uh, mm. It was like instead of A for adulteress, I had to wear the S for showgirls. Yeah. And one particularly mean review, uh, the New Yorker critic Anthony Lane said of Berkeley, she can't act, but watching her try to act to do the things acting is rumored to consist of is moving. Like that's just that's Ooh. so shitty. That's yeah. so shitty. God. And and the critics were so cruel, specifically to Berkeley and her performance, that this film that was supposed to shoot her to stardom effectively ended her film career. Her agent dropped her uh, right after Showgirls, and she's been mostly relegated to TV guest roles for basically the whole quarter century since this film's release. One of her most ho- high profile credits in the last decade was being on Dancing with the Stars. Mm. where she recreated the i'm so excited scene from saved by the bell by the way it's it's pretty fun (laughs) there was a 2015 interview with paul verhoven uh and he even admits that the film completely ruined her career yeah Uh, just because it's sad i'm not going to do the goofy uh, impersonation but he he says showgirls certainly ruined the career of elizabeth berkeley in a major way it made my life more difficult but not to the degree that it did elizabeth's Hollywood turned their backs on her. If somebody has to be blamed, it should be me because I thought it was interesting to portray somebody like that. I had hoped the end of the movie would explain why she acted that way when it's revealed she has convictions linked with drugs, but that too turned out to be a big mistake. I asked Elizabeth to do all of that, to be abrupt and to act in that way, but people have been attacking her for that ever since. I did consider that people would think she had a borderline personality but that was because her character had a history of drug abuse so i tried to express that through abruptness yeah so and that that uh interview you're talking about gary i've actually got uh, i read that same one it's from the new york daily news 2015 for the film's uh, anniversary and he, he goes on to say in that same interview he says we were making a film this is a quote we were making a film that was hyperbolic and an exaggeration so my intention was always to use a style that was exaggerated in everything so he's he's referring to not only berkeley's performance but the the film as a whole he says still to this day it's widely considered a bad movie but i think that's because people still don't understand it i used exaggerated nudity colors and movement i was trying to make it as exaggerated as las vegas is in real life that's why the musical numbers are as bad as they are i purposely tried not to make good music in those scenes but obviously that turned out to be a mistake and i'm sure we will Discuss more of Verhoeven's intentions here in a bit, but I I do believe that he did ask Berkeley to act in that over the top manner and that her performance has, you know, she's the movie's become kind of known primarily because of her performance. I mean, there are other baffling decisions made along the way, but she does get the brunt of the criticism. And it's a shame that it essentially ruined her career because she was just doing what her director said. 
Yeah. And maybe he knew that this was a wild decision, or maybe he knew it was for the it was what was best for the movie, or he thought it was what was best for the movie, regardless of how the actress was going to be perceived. I mean, it's not unlike him asking Sharon Stone to uncross her legs without her panties on and basic instinct without her uh, supposed knowledge of it. You know, he's he's looking at the movie as a whole and what it should mean. I'm not Side note, he supposedly <laughs> asked uh, Gina Gershon to do the same thing in this movie and she refused. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> just well, throwing I mean, that out there. <laughs> wait, it's, you know, from what from what we've heard of the way he interacts with cast, especially, well, I guess male or female it's he's kind of like this is what i'm telling you to do and i expect you to do it to the t yeah regardless you know and if you can't do that there's the door or we could go ahead and make this film it's because yeah, it's, it's fun to pick on nomi like it's yeah. it's because the character's insane but <laughs> right. it's uh yeah it, it, it does get a little cruel sometimes a lot of times especially back then with the reviews like going towards Elizabeth Berkeley when when mm-hmm. she's taking direction she's like new she's like trying to break out and like we talked about separate herself from her stereotyped existence in acting and her TV acting and all of this so she gets shit on a lot but Nomi is written to be a Nomi is weird in all the ways like she yeah. is weird yeah. in in the script she is weird in the, the directing like, yeah. the performance like all of it I mean in the, in the that, that commentary track again I think the guy says it, she has two modes it is staring and kicking things this is <laughs> slowly evolving into slamming things down <laughs> I saw one critic who said that she had two modes hot and bothered <laughs> And they said, but then even in the movie, nobody can resist Nomi because nobody knows why. Nobody comes within her orbit without making her the center of their universe. Yeah, they instantly <laughs> fall in love with her. Yeah. So, so to add insult to injury, Showgirls also won a record number of Golden Raspberry Awards. Now, we've gone on record here, I think, in the past as saying, or at least I have, of saying that the Razzies, I think, are bullshit. Uh, I don't think you should celebrate something you think is bad if you're sell- if, if you're being cruel, uh, which I think the Razzies are fairly cruel a lot of times. Because here's the thing, I mean, regardless of what you think of a movie, and, and we'll, obviously, we will say when we think a movie is bad, but to celebrate it is a, like, and to give it an award for being bad is a whole different level that I think is just mean. Because, yeah. like, hundreds of people worked on this movie. Like, it worked very hard on it. Yeah. Now, the director may have been making bad decisions. The director may have uh, derailed it, or the studio may have got involved, or there's a hundred other factors that could cause a movie to be bad. But the guy who's working as a gaffer, he's just trying to pull in a paycheck. And to say that, like, this movie he worked on is the worst movie is, I think, shitty. And it also cultivates a negativity that I think is unhealthy. You know, I, I, I'd rather just say, hey, this is bad. Let's move on uh, or discuss why it's bad. You know, but don't give it a fucking award. Maybe yeah. sometimes just really lead into the fact that this is your opinion that it's bad, and this yeah. is why I don't like it. It's right. tough. I, I just saw recently. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but like on Twitter, like a couple of weeks ago, as we're recording this, uh, Cinema Sins uh, from YouTube, which has become a huge thing, uh, which I know. also don't like for the yeah, very well, same reason. So <laughs> it came up because like somebody criticized them, and then like one. I forget who it was. Like an actor actually stood up for them and says they've re reimagined criti- film criticism or something like that. And then there was like, anyway, it was a trending topic on Twitter worldwide because like people were arguing about whether cinema sins is good or bad, you know, cause if for, for anybody who doesn't know, that's the YouTube channel where they like, you know, everything wrong with ups. black widow. Yeah. yeah like yeah. That, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very cynical way of viewing things. Right. Um, I, I personally dislike cinema sins because I think that's, it's cynical and it's like, we're looking for things to not like about a movie, uh, which is not the way to approach things. Yeah. Right. You know, that's just not, not a way to approach art of any kind. You don't, actively look for something to dislike yeah uh, you should look for the best and, and if it ends up failing that's one thing but if you're actively going into something going i'm going to find everything that's wrong with there will be blood the most celebrated movie of the 2010s but i'm going to find everything wrong with it right, right. like that's shitty like why why put, yeah. why, put, I mean, why put your nobody, energy into that nobody nobody said to hey you know what let's go make a movie that 
everyone hates that'll right. ruin our careers that'll yeah. lose all the money nobody does that right exactly. so i mean everyone has the best yeah. intentions right right that's that's the tough part with criticism in general is <laughs> that you're 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 in general like you're you're picking apart someone's vision and so uh, it's you gotta i don't know i mean even, it, even what hand, we do even what we do here i feel is fairly good natured i, yeah, I mean, try I, to be yeah i yeah. think it's fine to criticize flaws in a movie i right. don't think that that should be your goal i think we also are like very movie. clear about when we're joking around and like fucking with something and yeah yeah you know, having fun um i yeah it's it is weird because there, there's certainly, uh, for those of you who have ever been on the internet, um, <laughs> there's an audience for uh, cynicism. There's an audience for yeah. uh, being cruel, trying to be funny and cruel at the same time. It happens in everything. It yeah. happens from Star Trek to wrestling to movies. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's just in all the music, whatever. If you could be a dick about it and it's funny, then you know, you get celebrated for that if you're yeah. if you're hilarious when you're being an asshole. So, <laughs> yeah. And the Razzies have been doing this since the pre-internet days. The Razzies have been around since the 80s uh, doing this shit. And the, the only reason I really mentioned it or, or bring it up is because the, the quote unquote badness of Showgirls is a big part of its legacy. So it, it winning a record number of Razzies is still part of its legacy. And it, it won those Razzies for worse music Worst original song, worst actress, worst new star, worst screenplay, worst picture, and what I think is most offensively, worst director. Because you could you could say one thing about Verhoeven's decisions in this film, but it's an impeccably made film. Uh, from a technical standpoint, it's it's a very well made movie. This is not mm. like Plan Nine from Outer Space, where the I was going to say, like one of the out. things you keep seeing is like the so bad it's good thing. I don't know. Like I always think of those movies as a. It's weird. It's a different thing. Like it, it's. So bad, it's good. Like uh, you know, when they tried to make uh, what was, I want to say Napoleon Dynamite, but I don't, Black Dynamite or uh, yeah, 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 where it's intentionally, where it's intentionally like like the boom mic is hanging down yeah, up above, yeah. or like you can see the seams on this or whatever. But like this movie's like looks amazing. It does, yeah, <laughs> it really looks great. It does. I mean, this is it, it's a different type of situation than something like glenn danzig's veronica okay that is a poorly made film from from all aspects you know like poorly written poorly acted poorly directed poorly lit like it is it's a bad movie uh you know that said i still want to do a deep dive into oh i will (laughs) dude i would absolutely do that (laughs) so uh anyway the the razzies verhoeven actually made history by becoming the first director ever to attend the razzies ceremony to personally accept his award for worst director and here's what he said during his acceptance speech when i was making movies in the netherlands my films were judged by the critics as decadent, perverted, and sleazy. So I moved to the United States. This was 10 years ago. In the meantime, my movies are criticized for being decadent, perverted, and sleazy in this country. I'm very glad that I got all of these awards because it certainly means that I am accepted here and that I am part of the great American society. (laughs) He's He's kind of joking here, but he's also... There's, there's a little bit of hurt under that because he's like, I basically got ran out of my own country because they thought that the movies I was making were too sleazy and too perverted. And, you know, and then I come here and you guys are doing the same thing to me. And yeah, he jokes around saying, oh, I feel accepted here. Like this is like just like my home country because I'm being treated the same way. But it's like also you can kind of tell that he's a little bit hurt by that, you know, mm-hmm. and because he was he was criticized by film reviewers in the Netherlands. And now it's happening here again in the U.S. Like. I mean, Basic Instinct, we talked about it last week. It was not exactly a critical darling. Like, there were critics who liked it and there were critics who didn't, but it didn't just get pummeled by critics the way that Showgirls was. Mm. So, speaking of being pummeled by critics, Gary, (laughs) (laughs) uh, and speaking of the internet and cynicism (laughs) on the internet, uh, they, I have to, I have to wonder what kind of modern reviews you, you were able to dig up on this one. Almost too many to go through, but as you can expect, I mean, one of my favorite parts of the uh, commentary track, again, I've mentioned it so many times, but it is very funny, uh, is that every time Elizabeth Berkeley dances, the, the guy is just like, Jesus, won't somebody do something for her? <laughs> 
And you can imagine with all that jerking and flailing that, you know, it wears you out. And, and, and it wears the viewer out too, which is why someone needs a nap. Great segue, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> this is from Shot26, who says, not even good if you're looking for this sort of thing. If you like porn, don't watch it. If you like musicals with dance, don't watch it. If you like drama, don't watch it. I can't think of any reason to watch this. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, this one review says, a hooker hitchhikes her way... To- or, or, a hooker hitchhikes... A hooker hitchhikes her way to Las Vegas, ruins the lives of every single person she comes into contact with, and then leaves. That is literally this entire movie. And this takes over two hours to trudge through. Nomi Malone is the most unlikable protagonist, if you can even call her that, in cinematic history. I never thought a movie could make naked women boring, but this one did just that. Avoid this like the plague. Well, we're doing a great job of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's a review from Jack Ryan. I assume oh, that's the, the, the Tom Clancy character. character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, uh, when you're on covert missions for the company, how do you? How else do you unwind? But by yeah. popping in showgirls, you're like hanging out <laughs> in your safe house, and uh, and then you hop on uh, Letterboxd or Amazon or somewhere, and you say, "I'm fairly sure this is the least sexy sex movie ever made." Since it's Verhoeven, we can be charitable and assume that's on purpose. That it's supposed to be to sexy movies what Starship Troopers was to space operas. But Troopers is pretty brilliant satire, and all the terrible acting and ridiculous dialogue serve a higher purpose. Here, it's all just terribleness and ridiculousness, so badly bad it makes your eyes and your ears and your brain hurt. Intentionally or not, it's assaultively, painfully awful. Worst of all, it makes you never want to have or even think about having sex again. (laughs) Uh, Here's one from DJ, not our DJ, but another. To say that this movie sucked would be an insult to all things that have a purpose to their sucking. The suckage in this worthless movie is completely without purpose. If you enjoy seeing semi-attractive girl go from zero to mega bitch in half a second for no reason at all, you can watch the first 20 minutes of Showgirls or call your ex-girlfriend. Same thing. (laughs) Also, you may want to talk to a therapist. In short, I'd rather set fire to my pubic carriage and try to put it out with a hammer than spend (laughs) one moment of the rest of my life watching this horrible crime against humanity. Wow. (laughs) Jeez. Wow. Uh, Here's Henry. Half Star says, it's free to stream, but I want my money back. (laughs) Uh, And we were were worried that these reviews were going to be boring. (laughs) <laughs> this is a uh, Byron. This is the single greatest piece of cinematic excrement I have ever seen. This is the most disjointed, poorly paced, whack job motivated film I have ever had the displeasure of witnessing. The protagonist is, from the opening scene, the single worst human being to ever been born. She's rude, aggressive, a flat out cunt. And yet, despite this, almost everyone she meets wants the best for her. She's given so many opportunities for no fucking reason, and she spits in everyone's face to thank them. A truly despicable attempt at filmmaking. Let's get some women reviews. Here's here's Adriana. She says, me for two hours. This is on purpose. (laughs) Me for the next 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> Here is uh, Sam. She says it is absolutely baffling just how utterly repulsive and dumb and stupid and exploitative and horrific and appalling and vile and terrible and poorly acted and lifeless and laughable and cringe and long and hideous and abhorrent and sleazy and funny and investing and inter- entertaining and fuck. Hold on. Do I like this garbage film? I'm so confused right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, Lucy Van Dam says, I came three times. Good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it goes on to say, this movie made me tired of seeing titties. Why is it two hours long? It's borderline laughable. Everyone in it is horribly miscast. The dialogue's hilariously awful. And the main character is childish and annoying. It has no idea what it wants to say or how to say it. 
Come on, Paul Verhoeven. You're better than this. Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm not surprised by those, but you know, at the time of its release, the movie, it was destroyed by critics as well. And it was not only destroyed by critics, but it was a major commercial failure. It recouped only about half of its cost from U.S. theaters. And the rejection by the general public kind of shook Verhoeven. Uh, Here's what he had to say. It makes you lose your confidence. You question yourself in any way. Am I too old? Am I out of touch? Am I too personal? Or is my personality so perverted that the audience rejects it? <laughs> so, I mean, you, it makes you wonder, like, what, what did, are those the reasons? Like, what did happen? Why was Showgirl such a commercial failure with, I mean, with, with Verhoeven's reputation and with all of the marketing? Uh, did he simply give American audiences more sex than they could handle in a mainstream movie? Or, or maybe people were just ashamed to attend. Maybe people were just embarrassed. And this is honestly kind of what I think. Maybe they were just embarrassed to go to the box office to ask for a ticket to showgirls. They didn't want to be seen as the kind of person going to see this kind of movie. Yeah. And there's evidence in this theory in the film's home video sales because it did great numbers on videos. It brought in more than $100 million in video rentals. Uh, so people, it's not that people didn't want to see it. They didn't want to go. They didn't want to be seen seeing it, uh-huh. you know? Uh, now, a lot of these people may have also been watching it ironically, like someone watches something like The Room. Uh, it's hard to say, but some of these people probably were just very interested in actually seeing it, but didn't want to go up to a box office and buy a ticket. You know, that's and 100%. They want to say, One like showgirls, please. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because I remember at the time it was, you know, it was nobody, at least the word of mouth, unless you were just like super into movies, like reading critical reviews of things, which as much as we'd like to, uh, you know, put ourselves over or something like most people aren't doing that. The majority of, you know, movie viewership isn't those kind of people and people uh, like us. Yeah. Like people (laughs) like us. I mean, and so they're, um, you know, they're probably just interested in what what the main uh, drive is behind the movie, which in this movie is obviously the sex. And, and so, yeah, it, it, it's like you're asking everybody to purchase the uh, ticket to the the 80s Times Square, like sex theater or whatever, right. you know. Right. right. But, you know, video sales combined with strong theater attendance and, and less inhibited European market actually did help the film eventually turn a profit. It actually did fairly well in Europe. And despite those, you know, those recent reviews that Gary read off, the film has gone on to become a cult classic. Uh, it's it's played at midnight screenings where, you know, Rocky Horror style, they would have audiences shout along uh, with the characters and they'd have people lap dancing. It's been really embraced by the drag community. Uh, Peaches Christ, I don't I know if you guys are familiar with Peaches. Peaches Christ hosts, or I don't know if she still does, but hosted screenings of this where they would act out scenes from the film on stage as the film played, just like Rocky Horror, like a shadow cast, you know, and and it's been embraced as this camp classic. And it is arguably more popular now than it has ever been. Uh, in, in a later interview, this is from just a couple of years ago, Verhoeven said, uh, maybe this kind of ritualistic cult popularity isn't what i intended but it's like the resurrection after the crucifixion so uh Verhoeven of course is still he sticking did. sticking with the, the jesus stuff yeah. <laughs> i wasn't aware of the drag thing but they even mentioned that in the commentary the guys like i learned you know like showcasing this that he's like that this is like a staple in the drag community like, it is, this yeah. is you have wow. to watch this movie this is like uh you know uh lesson one yeah. <laughs> it's like they show yeah. showgirls yeah <laughs> Uh, and and the film's various re-releases on the midnight movie circuit and things like that, these you know, screenings, repertory screenings, has ironically actually made it one of the most profitable titles in MGM's back catalog. The movie has to date, and this is not including those video rentals I m- mentioned earlier. This is at the box office. The film has grossed over one hundred million dollars at the box office because wow. of these screenings, when it barely made twenty million upon original release. Wow. So I guess here's the million dollar question though. Is Showgirls as bad as its reputation? Uh, like for my money, it, I don't think it is. I mean, are, are there some truly bizarre decisions being made by Verhoeven that would 
make people perceive this as a bad movie yeah but that doesn't necessarily make the movie bad not like in a it's not an incompetently made movie it's a right. very competently made film mm-hmm. uh, there's just some bizarre decisions going on but they're very intentional decisions there were there were parts like in the uh, co- uh I, I know i keep saying this but it lends itself to this the commentary track again one of the things the guy says at one point that i wholeheartedly disagreed with as funny as he is as he said the great the the magic of showgirls is that everybody from paul verhoeven to elizabeth berkeley to the gaffers like they're all making the worst decisions possible throughout the movie and i was like ah, no man the movie's good looking like the movie's yeah. like the movie is you know it's weird it's fucking weird it but is, so are weird. all of paul verhoeven's movies yeah. really yeah and so i was like i wasn't as put off from it. i mean like so so it would go back to the thing of like what are you expecting out of it i guess because no it's not i bought showgirls and do i regret having bought showgirls i 100 percent do not regret no showgirls. i will rewatch it often yeah i could see <laughs> myself rewatching showgirls showgirls is insane like it's it's yeah. fun it's fun it's a fun movie to watch it, it'll be a fun one to like have people over to like have movie night because it's just one of those movies that like it almost demands a a group experience so that everyone mm-hmm. can like witness this together uh, me and my wife the rocky it. horror thing that you mentioned is is like a perfect yes. example yeah yeah <laughs> watching it, rocky horror by yourself doesn't hit as hard as watching it with people right you know whether it's a uh, whether it's a movie theater audience or just a bunch of friends over at your house you know it's not the same thing or you know i i only, i watch showgirls with with my wife and it was just the two of us but it was fun watching it together and she wanted to watch it again immediately. She loved it. <laughs> I watched it with my wife who was uh, at first turned off like, or not, I don't know if turned off is the right word, but she was just like, are you guys talking about a porno? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is this movie? And then as the further we get along, she just had a lot of moments where she's just like, what the fuck? Yeah. What, there's, what a moments, there's a lot of those moments in it. <laughs> what <laughs> is this movie? And, you know, this is for my wife who's not even like invested cinematically as us, I guess you could say, but it's just like, it's one of those movies. It's like, it's, it's, fucking fun to watch it's it's a blast was I mean, this your if you first get time past, unless it? you're unless you're like real timid about nudity i get it and yeah. elizabeth berkeley definitely like hops and de- hops up and down on agent cooper's dick in a pool you know <laughs> there's there's some weird stuff like that uh but you know as we've discussed in previous episodes we 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 imagine rutger hauer in that situation <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But uh, on Agent Cooper's dick, yeah, on Agent <laughs> Cooper's dick. This is what oh, I've been okay. talking about the whole time. Okay. Like, if they <laughs> had kept their relationship alive, it could have been Rutger Howard bouncing on Agent as Cooper's Nomi. dick as Nomi, as Nomi. different <laughs> places. <laughs> uh, uh, so, this was your first viewing, Gary, or had you seen this before? Oh, no, I've seen it before. Come on, man. Yeah. I worked in a video store. Yeah, uh, I, about to say. <laughs> <laughs> I got well, my hands and it this. wasn't a blockbuster, yeah. And I'm well, from the age before Pornhub too, so I definitely yeah, had yeah. it on Skidamax. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've what seen this you, movie before. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was uh, I had seen this probably in my late teens, early twenties. Um, yeah. I had a copy uh, that I had bought for uh, the reason a late teen or early twenty year old <laughs> would buy this movie. Movies. I was yeah, about to say yeah. this might uh, have been the first time. Sorry, Todd, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, uh, this might be the first time to say that I've watched this movie trying to watch it critically. <laughs> 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 well, how did that turn out for you? I mean, you, you, Gary, you seem to really in, like have fun with it. Oh no, I loved it. I, I thought <laughs> it's insane. Like that's yeah. the only word I have for it. Yeah, the, it's the nuts. movie is it's... fuck nuts, <laughs> but it's. <laughs> But I think it's a blast. So that's the thing, though. Like, do, is a movie a bad movie when it's a well-made movie that has some just really weird, bizarre stuff going on? Like, what does that make it a bad movie? That's I guess that depends on your definition of a bad movie. Because I, I don't it, think that. Go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say I think it depends on what you're going in there for. I mean, yeah. you guys, you guys have. I've been on the show with you guys long enough for you guys to know me. I kind of really get into the story and, you know, the character development and the, you know, what these, what these folks are doing. And it is super over the top. You talk about uh, on movie sets, you know, uh, poor acting decisions. 
And I think someone who doesn't know all the background info could easily watch this movie and be like, did the editor only choose the bad acting decisions? Cause there <laughs> seems to be a lot of them um, yep. or just ones that are again, super over the top. But you know, when you get into it with this whole series, this whole series leading up is perfect, you know, a perfect introduction for someone to sit down and watch this and go, Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. See, I see what you're doing there. Becoming and, familiar with Verhoeven's work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it goes a long it, ways. It, exactly. And it's, you know, and it, yeah. I mean, we, we mentioned it earlier in this episode, Elizabeth Berkeley. Okay. Yeah. It's maybe a bad performance, but we're pretty sure she was going strictly off of what Verhoeven was not, telling her to do. And she's not phoning it in. No, no. She's, she's given swing, 110%. She swings for the fences on Absolutely. everything. Yeah. On every, everybody does. Even everybody when she should does. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. She, <laughs> like when she's putting ketchup on her fries. She's right. For the fences. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That was, that was really the moment, wasn't it? I, <laughs> you know what it originally came to mind? Like I had, I, I mean, I'm going to say something that might be embarrassing to the film critic community. So I apologize uh, if this makes me an idiot, but when there's lots of things that make you an idiot, Gary, it's so true. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it is true. But when star Wars episode seven came out uh, and everybody called Ray, a Mary Sue or, or the one person did and that it just called somebody on that, did. Yeah. yeah. The debate was happening. I was like, what the fuck is a Mary Sue? Like I had, I'm, no... I'm not familiar with that. What is that? Well, it's just a, a person. I mean, my understanding of it now is just like it's it's like a woman character who like everything just the universe just bids to support this person. She's, she, oh, okay. Yeah, she's like a right. free free of weakness. Like she just can do everything she needs to do. You know, I like idealized. You know, so oh, I was gosh. reading about this usually with like Ray, and I was like, ah, I don't know, like whatever. But I watched this movie, and as I was watching, I was like. Nomi is totally a Mary Sue. <laughs> yeah. that is like, I was like, when, when Molly comes up to her and it's just like, you know, Nomi is like beating the fuck out of her car and she's like, hold on. And then like has to punch her in the face and she throws up and it's like, let me buy you dinner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, and then she's, then she's just inviting her to live with her. And then they, then they go to dinner and they're sitting there and she's just like, where are you from? The East Coast. Oh, well, where are the East Coast? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, and she still loves her. I'm like, oh, okay, come yeah. live with me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that's that's a Mary Stu. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, what yeah. that is. Like a yeah. moth to, to the flame that is Nami. Here is everyone. <laughs> like just been a like the fucking one dude in the club, like sees her dancing. It's not like, man, that cracked out bitch. He's like, oh, look at her dance. You got the best natural talent of any dancer I've ever seen. And I'm like, like did you see her dancing? Like, no, she, take, she looks like she's she's she like fucking Elaine up. from Seinfeld dancing. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, who is this girl that like the world just turns over, bends over backwards to like yeah. be a part of Nolby's life? Like, this is and he like, should know. He was in New York. He studied in New York. <laughs> so when you start reading essays about showgirls, like you start inevitably finding references to Susan Sontag's famous essay from 1964 called Notes on Camp. Uh, you, this is I, I, I've seen this come up probably a half dozen times in my research. So in that essay, she wrote that something could be defined as camp because of its love of the unnatural, of artifice and exaggeration. So if that's not a definition of what showgirls is, like, I don't know what is. Well, uh, it, of, what showgirl, of what showgirls is or what it has become. I think part of what Verhoeven's trying to show in this movie is the, the artifice and exaggeration that comes in American culture in general, but specifically in Las Vegas. Mm. I mean, every nothing you see in Las Vegas is what it appears to be. Right. You know, uh, and, and Showgirls has undoubtedly become a camp classic. Like there's nothing in this movie that's understated. It's all overblown and exaggerated and ridiculous. Everything yeah. about it. Like, like, I mean, the, the shows that you see, the, the, uh, the goddess show, like that's ridiculous, you know, that that would be on stage. And I mean, not that these shows haven't existed, they have, but then to have, the press mobbing 
uh, uh, Crystal at the end, like she's some kind of celebrity because she stars in a Las Vegas show. Like what fucking world does this live in? But it's this like overblown, <laughs> exaggerated world that Paul Verhoeven and Joe Esterhaus have created here. Which is which is like his mo. Like I yeah. mean, it, it's everything's it's over the top. Even so I mean, Basic Instinct is his most grounded that we've seen so far. And it's look at that interrogation scene. Have what what police station looks like that? I was gonna like, say I've yeah. seen a lot of interrogation rooms. <laughs> that one's beautiful. <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and let our listeners know that Todd is not a criminal. <laughs> Todd, Todd oh, has yeah. a background in law enforcement. Sorry. <laughs> I've seen a lot of interrogation rooms. <laughs> I've been, uh, you know, <laughs> none of them were like a that week. one was. <laughs> I love pre- I love precinct coffee. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but there, the thing is, what I'm saying is like, there's nothing in the story that's the least bit realistic. So even know me being this, like like Gary said, a, a like a, like a light that these everyone is attracted to. Uh, I can buy that because nothing else about the movie pretends that it's realistic until the the rape scene at the end which feels a little out of left field which i'm sure we'll talk about here in a second but i i think the rest of it being so exaggerated does feel very intentional i i think at least on verhoven's part i can't say for sure what esther house was thinking um but yeah like it starts off crazy like the first five minutes you've got nomi on the side of the road with her weird leather you know fringe leather jacket hitchhiking uh she pulls a knife on a guy immediately do, and doesn't act like a human being ever. She yeah. acts like an alien that has seen humans <laughs> once. In the commentary, like just throughout, the guy's like, "I love Joe Esterhaus's Martian women." <laughs> yeah. uh, th- th- this guy who picks her up steals her shit, and, and you know, and then she starts when she figures it out. Th- like in the scene Gary was mentioning, she just starts wailing on that car. The owner of that car punches her and makes her throw up, and then Nomi just starts crying in her arms immediately and they're best friends and it, we're and we're seven minutes into the movie or something at this point and then there's monkeys there's fucking monkeys shitting on, on things there's sequins and nipples everywhere yeah. <laughs> and then there's this moment one of my favorite moments of the movie which i'm like you have you cannot watch this movie and see this scene and not know that it's some kind of satire is that when robert davi and the lady with the that keeps doing the honk thing where her boobs pop out you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, mama uh, bazooms <laughs> mama bazooms yeah so they're they're talk- they're visiting nomi at the stardust and robert davi he, in this very like wistful contemplative way very serious says it must be weird not having anyone come on you (laughs) how can you watch that scene and not know that somebody's fucking like goofing on you like somebody he's playing (laughs) because he's being like the sweet like i was hard on you kid but you've really come a long way (laughs) you've come a long (laughs) way oh no pun intended i was gonna say (laughs) how is that spelled is that with a U or with an O? (laughs) but i mean there are all these like bizarre weird moments and you can't watch all this stuff and not somehow know that verhoven is doing this shit on purpose like it is very (laughs) intentional uh i mean and Verhoeven has said that it's all on purpose. Like now, now Kyle McLaughlin in recent interviews has said that like, no, we all thought we were making like a serious drama and maybe he did. And maybe he wasn't let in on because actors, an actor is not always let in on a director's intention. Mm-hmm. You know, the mm-hmm. actors let in on whatever the director needs him to know to get the performance that he needs out of them to further that intention. But that doesn't mean that he's telling him every little thing. Right, you know, I so believe maybe, that about Kyle, but I believe Jen and Gashawn knew exactly what she was doing. Even if she wasn't, she, if she wasn't told, she figured it out. She knows she exactly figured it out. She she's doing. It. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she is great. She uh, she is great in this movie. Like she plays up that, that like Texas drawl, and like she's she knows exactly what the hell kind of movie she's in. Right. Uh, <laughs> she she's. I think she's great. Honestly, I think she, Jenna she's the, is great the best this. actor in this movie. Yeah. Like she she. I mean, as far as like knowing what to do and when like she just she just owns it like the yeah. whole thing yeah, yeah. and here, here's another quote from Verhoeven this is uh similar to what um this is a, another you know 2015 article from the 20th anniversary of this uh, this time with Rolling Stone he actually wrote an article for Rolling Stone about the film like uh, this big essay and he said and this is another direct quote uh, I always felt that it was what you might call a hyperbolic approach to filmmaking 
yes, it was over the top and that was on purpose. And he's got that in italic, you know, letters that was on purpose. The environments were very flashy. There were too many lights, too many idiotic things and too much Vegas, not only the surroundings, but Vegas in the way people behaved and the dialogue and the acting as for the finished product. I thought it was perfect. Otherwise I would have changed it. He he's 20 years later saying this movie's the movie I wanted to make. He thinks it's his best movie. He thinks it's his, or at least at that time he was saying it was, and this was five years ago. He was saying, this is my best movie. This is the movie. This is the most sophisticated movie that I've made. People just are, are still figuring it out. And, you know, I think that's cool. And from a technical standpoint, it is a very well-made film, but I do think that Verhoeven knew what he was doing. Mm. Well, and, and even, by the way, from, from a visual standpoint, before we move on, I do want to mention, uh, Yost Vacano, who we've mentioned before, he's worked with Verhoeven several times. His work here is really great. That's in the steady cam work that he does, uh, like backstage and everything. Like it is uh, like moving through the, oh, even the so casinos good. and like, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, he's great. Uh, and even, you know, I, I've picked on Joe Esterhaus a lot, but like even him, like the reason he put out that thing about like young girls, you know, like go in to see this movie, like present your fake idea IDs. The reason he took up that ad is he thought that the movie was advertised. According to him, he thought the movie was advertised a lot on the sex and the, um, he, he thought his explanation was that it was, uh, you know, that they, they were, what was the word? Uh, it highlighted the exploitations that lap dancers are subjected to. That's what he thought the movie was. And he told, he said that he thought the studio was using cheap marketing tricks the whole time to, yeah. to sell the yeah. film. So his even thing was like, the reason he said like young people should use fake IDs and get in there is just like to show young women, uh, this is what happens here, you know, yeah. that kind of like thing. a warning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing about this is that the thing about this movie, and this is something that Verhoeven also points out in that Rolling Stone article, is that there's hardly any sex scenes in the movie. You know, Basic Instinct is filled with sex scenes. Mm-hmm. I mean, all, all over the place. But Showgirls, there's only one consensual sex scene in the movie, and that's between Nomi and Kyle McLaughlin in the pool. That's it. Everything else is just women walking around naked or dancing on stage. That's the only actual sex scene in the movie. Uh, but Basic Instinct, because it's part of, because there's this like thriller aspect of it, it doesn't get judged the same way because... Showgirls doesn't have that. Showgirls is just about this girl who wants to be a dancer. She wants to be a star and that becoming a star involves a lot of, a lot of nudity. But when you throw in the danger aspect where there's a sex scene, but also it might mean Sharon Stone's about to murder a guy, then it becomes more acceptable somehow. Mm, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's really weird. But, you know, in the movie, after it came out on video, that's when MGM really tried to capitalize on its its uh, its popularity or its burgeoning popularity. I remember there being this big DVD box set that came out. I think it was around the 10th anniversary of the film, probably around 2005. And it it's where that that uh, commentary that Gary's talking about actually originated on this this DVD. It's this big box set, and it came with a poster of Nomi and a pin the pasties on the stripper game. Mm. That was part <laughs> of it. Like they were they were playing up the like reputation of the film at this point you know uh, but in recent years it's it's been kind of reevaluated not as a just like so bad it's good cult classic but as an actual good film like there are critical reevaluations that say that this movie is a better film than you might think uh one of the books that i read in preparation for this is called uh, it doesn't suck which is a great name for a, a book about showgirls. Right. Uh, it's by Adam Naiman, this Canadian film writer. He's really good. He's written some great books about the Coen brothers and Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, and then I also watched the documentary from last year by Jeffrey McHale called You Don't Know Me. And these works, these, these this book, and, and, and Adam Naiman is, uh, Todd, I know you watched it, but in You Don't Know Me, he gets interviewed a lot. Yeah. In that. Uh, and these, these works and many others like them, the film has begun to be read as, as a satire with everything that critics hated about it upon release kind of being reconsidered as completely intentional, kind of like what we're doing here. Right. Uh, You know, and that like, if you, if you like this movie or if you don't like, I would recommend, you know, 
especially the movie because it's a, only a you know an hour and a half of your time but it's a it's a good look at at the critical reevaluation of of showgirls yeah i i wholeheartedly agree that that documentary is very it's very eye opening yeah to cuz it is it is very easy to form a hard opinion uh, no pun intended uh, a <laughs> I was hard about to go there on this movie <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to form a really solid, un- a really rigid, very rigid, you know, uh, very- throbbing <laughs> even, uh, <laughs> uh, but a really solid opinion about this movie at face value. Yeah. You know, um, for, but- first viewing on this for most people is not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to see every intention of, of the film. You're going to, because the first thing that you see is, you know, Elizabeth Berkeley's performance or the weird, bizarre dialogue like the dog chow doggy chow sure. scene you know and uh, the weird filmmaking decisions that Verhoeven made like those are the things that pop out at you first right until you start like really digging into it and mm-hmm. but the thing is if you it, like we're doing with this show and this is our fifth episode in the series if you think about this in the context of Verhoeven's career like anyone who's seen the man's work knows that he works heavily in satire so why why are people not seeing this film in the same way? You know, uh, why are people seeing RoboCop, even critics at the time when RoboCop came out, they're being able to view that as a satire. Is it because the violence in that film is more acceptable than the sex in this film? Uh, For some reason they see that and they think satire, but they see this and they don't think satire. They think that he's just being a bad filmmaker when clearly everything he does is purposeful. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, and, and we, we've talked about this, like, especially on Robocop, but really on, on Total Recall a lot as well. Verhoeven is pretty scathing in his views of a world that's ruled by capitalism, you know, mm. by capitalism run rampant. And w- what's a bigger example of capitalism run rampant than Las Vegas? You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, consider th- there's an exchange between, between Nomi and Crystal where Crystal accuses Nomi of being a whore. And he, she says, we all are. We take the cash, we cash the check, we show them what they want to see. Like that, that's a pretty scathing review of the industry. And it's what Las Vegas runs on, you know? Uh, suddenly, because he's using boobs to, to, to make his point, he's considered a pervert, but not when he's showing a guy melting and then getting hit by a car in Robocop. Then he's a genius, he's a social commentator, right. you know? And the, the film is pretty scathing in its view of the entertainment business specifically and the vulgarity and exploitation that exists within it, both on screen and off. And I mean, can you, can you name another film that is in which the systemic abuse and exploitation of women is so unflinchingly depicted? Like the, the way that the men act in this movie, every man in this movie is a shithead from James, yeah. the, the dancer up to, Kyle McLaughlin's character. They're all just trying to get move up the ladder or get ahead or make money by using Nomi as their tool to do so. And they don't care what happens to her right. in the meantime. To me, and I, I think this is kind of, I, I think it, it, to me, and this may go along with what we're talking about. Maybe it doesn't, but that moment where Kyle McLaughlin kind of has his hand on her throat, they're in the hospital and um, where he's revealed that he knows her backstory and all that yeah and he go and he says and he says you're gonna be a big star and you can see you can see what the cost of that is fine and that's kind of you see it on her face for a moment it's a pained a pained look of just yeah oh my god this is this is what it takes i i didn't know or maybe thought i could bypass it or whatever it was and i think it's uh I think it all for me it all comes to a head right there of just like oh gosh this is that moment this is, is dark. I think <laughs> like that's when she realizes that she's that that, that she's being exploited I think cuz yeah. she's seen the way that women are used because the because she's at the hospital visiting her friend who was brutally raped by that yanni looking motherfucker yeah and <laughs> and, and and that is the film's most controversial scene because it is the scene where it's like Oh man, we were having fun, and now Verhoeven had to throw this in there. And in fact, the guy who does the commentary on that Blu-ray, um, when he shows this movie live, and a lot of live 
performances of this movie do this. They skip that scene and they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell the context, but they're like, you know, this is not fun. <laughs> like this is, we're ha- we're here for a fun night to make, you know, crack jokes at this movie or whatever, but yeah, you show part- that scene and it's, yeah, like it's hard. It's hard to joke after that, you know. But that's the moment where she sees like that they're just being treated like dogs, yeah. you know. They really are, and and that's when she decides, hey, I'm, I got, I got to the top because I got, I got the the starring role in Goddess. Mm-hmm. But was it worth it? So she leaves town. Yeah. So she leaves town, but she leaves to go to fucking Hollywood where the same goddamn thing's going to happen to her. Yep. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I read plenty of reviews that really, you know, emphasize the fact that this movie seems like just over the top and ridiculous, except post Trump or Weinstein, you know, that, that, that it really, well, that's know, the thing, man, like Verhoeven, all of his movies have been this way. Like they, he is a, he is prescient. Like think of the corporatization that he satirized in RoboCop and, and how real that feels now mm-hmm. or, or think of starship troopers and how real that shit feels now. The, yeah. the fascism <laughs> that's, that's highlighted in that. Uh, yeah. Like he was doing the same thing with showgirls. Like he was, this is a, this is a, uh, you're, I'm surprised that the, the Kyle McLaughlin or the, uh, or the, uh, the, the guy who, produces the show or al doesn't have a line where he says grab him by the pussy you know like that that right yeah that seems like a line that would come out of one of the dudes in this movie and like verhoven was doing this shit 25 years ago you know jeez yeah i mean and and none of this reading is to discount the absolute insanity on screen you know i I think naaman in his book and in the documentary uh he classified the film best i think when he calls it a masterpiece of shit like, I think that's great because there is a lot of like weird, bad, bad, quote unquote, bad filmmaking decisions. But I I think that that term masterpiece of shit sort of embraces every facet of the movie because it is a very w- good movie. Yeah. It just does some really weird shit. I, I, I'd like to think that the shit is actually what they're commenting on. <laughs> Yeah, the, ma- yeah. the masterpiece is the film but it's about this shit <laughs> yeah yeah it re- i mean yeah it could absolutely be read that way so uh b- before we move on any further guys uh do you either of you have uh any further viewing for this one like if you were going to do a if you were going to do a, a double feature i don't know what you could put with this that would possibly compare um, but if you were going to do a double feature with showgirls what would you show well, the thing that really came to mind for me, Todd, I wish, uh, <laughs> I'm like basic instinct, by the way, is like the, the other movie, like I can think of. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I would, yeah. That would work. Watch this. Uh, you could do uh striptease with Demi Moore, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, I think striptease is the obvious one. It came out right around the same time, the next year, actually 96. And it uh, also won the Razzie for worst picture. It won six golden Razzies. So it, it was uh, <laughs> just under, just under Showgirls. But uh, you guys nice, remember the nice movie 54? <laughs> the Studio 54 movie? The, yeah, with, with Mike oh, Myers. Yeah, Mike Myers, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I remember that working in the video store at, at like the exact same time. Uh, so we'll uh, they, they would like play back to back on the uh, commercial thing sometimes. Although yeah, I yeah. think 54 was like, later 98 yeah it came out 98 but anyway go ahead that's that's all i got showgirls um, i mean uh striptease striptease yeah, yeah. Or, studio, or 54 yeah sure <laughs> yeah why not <laughs> yeah well i i think i would go or for say the... by the bell <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i think i would go with a similar theme but different end goal in mind how well the they uh accomplished this Probably Magic Mike. That That's seems to I, be, I was going to say Magic Mike. Dang, that, that seems is, to be yeah. like That's fun. Yeah. it's this, but it it's the comedic side, and this is you know. I mean, is it the, is, but it's. I mean, it's very. Still, it seems very good. It's very good natured. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's got some darkness to it as well. Uh, yeah, Magic Mike does. So the the first one, the second one's a little uh, more fun, I, th- I think. But yeah, and Magic Mike's a great movie. I mean, St- Steven Soderbergh, people, you know, people like to, yeah, I mean, it's another one of those that, like, people would love to shit on, but Magic Mike, Magic Mike's great. 
Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, well, that those were actually my my choices were going to be either striptease or magic mic. So we're all on the same wavelength here. So I think then that another uh, another option besides those, and we're breaking a little bit of our own rule here on this further viewing. But as Gary pointed out a couple of weeks ago, there is a Showgirls too. Uh, it's called Pennies Showgirls Two Pennies from Heaven. It came out in 2011. It's a great title. Uh, well, it's what star- a fuck a penny. Yeah. <laughs> So it stars Rena Rena Raphael, who plays Penny slash Hope <laughs> in the film. Uh, it it hope, not only not stars Rena Riffle, but it was written, produced, edited, and directed by her. Wow. Uh, and it was it was like a Kickstarter campaign, and it features a few people from the cast of Showgirls, including Glenn Plummer, uh, who plays James because uh, he's Penny's boyfriend, and she goes to like. Uh, she's trying to be uh, like on a TV show. It's also revealed that her full stripper name is Penny Slot. <laughs> oh, nice. I hope it's, you're establishing that we have to do a boldest episode on Penny <laughs> Because, <laughs> Well, here's the thing is not only is there, well, I, I've not seen Showgirls 2, Pennies from Heaven. It is not an official sanctioned sequel it was originally called something else it originally had a different name uh called like star dancer i think is what it was called but yeah straight to video and vod you know it, it was it didn't get a theatrical release so there's not really a critical consensus although i have to imagine probably not great yeah i'm 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 glad we're not doing that because whereas your wives were very accepting of this movie mine not so much no she to it, suck it up no. did she watch no. it <laughs> no no she was actually well, that's out of town at the time. her loss then so she might have loved it if she'd actually watched it <laughs> she might have. Yeah. there are so so pennies from heaven um yeah so that that that's that's a thing but also there is also a showgirls three called showgirls three london calling which jesus what i understand doesn't seem to have any of the same people involved in it either it's directed by someone named daniel mansfield who uh he has directed three other movies and they seem to be uh gay horror um like parodies <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway uh showgirls three london calling the plot of which i'm just gonna i'm just gonna read it to you okay Show business can be murder as disgraced child star Ruby Foxglove is set to return to the stage in an all new sexy version of Lady Shatterley's lover. Long, young ingenue Chiffon Collins also has her eye on the role and will stop at nothing to drag Ruby back into obscurity forever. It's lipsticks at dawn and the deranged duo head to the stage and this time revenge can be deadly. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. rival showgirls again. Uh, it's also known there's the alternate title, by the way, of this movie is you crazy bitch with an exclamation <laughs> point at the end of it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you wanted to do a double feature or a triple feature, go show girls one, two, and three. They're not related in any way whatsoever, <laughs> except for, <laughs> except for that one character, but yeah, yeah, whatever. It'd be a fun. They're surely probably terrible, uh, but you know, it could I be, fun. could be a fun imagine them not being terrible <laughs> yeah like what what do you even do yeah. hey guys the thing is is that it, what i love about this this podcast is that we educate the listeners and so i want to i mean obviously we've educated them on showgirls but one of the things like people may be watching this and thinking like is this real life is is strip tease an actual thing is you know like how do i give a lap dance well one of the beauty parts <laughs> of the blu-ray is there is actually with the girls from scores there is a which is a strip club in vegas i believe right you well in chicago and new york new york okay. yeah uh there is a whole lesson on uh how to give a proper lap dance nice. and i know. jotted down some notes and i just yeah. oh yes <laughs> yeah so i thought we should run through them really quick there's uh <laughs> several steps here but uh I thought this would even be better were it to be with a video with Todd performing all of these things. Oh man. Well, you guys maybe not know. Um, when I was at the YMCA, when I used to work at the YMCA, uh, that was my thing was anytime that someone had a birthday, um, they got, they got a, they got a lap dance from Todd 
whether wow. they wanted one or not. They got wow, the Todd's, you're about to get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> that does feel like a thing you can't do now. <laughs> but also, perhaps you could compare notes. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. At the time that I was working at the Y, I had seen Showgirls, and one of my moves was from <laughs> the lap dance that she gives. Uh, Kyle uh, McLaughlin? Yeah, where he Kyle comes in his pants. Did you make anyone yeah. come in their pants? <laughs> no, I would. Put, I would put. It's the one where she's got her foot up on the guy's shoulder, and yeah, bas- yeah it's that one. I Let me tell that. you how yeah. fucked up married life. You is. were more flexible back then than you I are was. now. That was many years. <laughs> that was many years and many pounds ago. <laughs> but say, let me tell you the the fucked up part about being married is that the the first reaction from that scene the wife and i both had is we looked at each other and said he has to walk around the rest of the night with cum pants cum in his pants that seems terrible it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be wet and, and then, then it's gonna, gonna be, be crusty and hard crusty. Uh, yeah, uh, gonna... and, then, and then what happens is the next day he's gonna do his laundry and be just ashamed of what he did the night before <laughs> right <laughs> oh man i can't believe i came in my pants out in public oh god <laughs> and, and gina gershon she wanted to drink for like three more hours so she's <laughs> sitting there with like wetness rubbing on my dick it was uncomfortable i thought i might get jock itch or something i don't know anyway so let's hear those let's hear those details gary come on no let's dwell on the cub pants thing <laughs> <laughs> Oh, our <laughs> show is awful. I'm sorry. Guys. <laughs> um, the uh, <laughs> step one: warm yourself up first. Mm. Let me jerk it, jerk off. Is no, that- <laughs> it means do stretches, some okay. yoga, perhaps. You wanna you wanna limber yourself up, ready to go for this. Mm-hmm. This is like pleasing your partner with. A lap dance. This is what this is about. Yeah. This is the girls from Scorch are trying to help you out, Justin. Thank you, ladies. Uh, step two: wear something that feels sexy. Hmm. They mentioned some gowns, lingerie. Uh, you can't what be about- sexy if you don't feel sexy. So you have to wear my Crocs. Yourself. <laughs> you have to just whatever it takes to pamper yourself ahead of time. You want to get with it. Step three, create a relaxing atmosphere. You want it to be cozy and intimate. It's to feel comfortable. Everyone's you're relaxed. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Relaxed. I don't step get it. four. Step four is get oral with music. Not like get oral with music. Get oral. Give A-U-R-A-L. oral with music. Blow job oh. with music. Yeah, sounds good. Is that it? Yeah, <laughs> but it's just use any music that makes you feel sexy. That's mm. what they really wanted to emphasize here. Yeah, what would your pick be? Mm. The Benny Hill theme song? <laughs> Damn it, you stole mine. <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with like George Michael. Uh, nice. Burda, burda, ba, ba, ba. Anything by Lint Biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> I just watched their Lollapalooza set. 10 out of 10. Would recommend. It's awesome. Yeah. It's really good. I love that they're getting the recognition they deserve. Yeah, I'm not being like ironic. A it's a killer performance. It's really good. They went through a period where everybody was like, oh, remember when fucking Lip Biscuit performed? I was like, man, I was fucking into that shit back in the day. It's cool that it's like not, you know, that there people are now like, Nah, man, it was fucking fun. Yeah. Anyway, what, is there another step to this? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like listen to Lip Biscuit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, step five tempt his other senses. You want to have some nice sense. Fart in his and, face. So that <laughs> is. It says, Don't knock it till you This try one it. lady said, I always suggest pink a eye. nice glass of champagne. Okay. Well, and champagne's always what good. goes better with champagne than strawberries? Mm. Oh, That's what she said. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, uh, that is that is what she said. Yeah, I don't. There's is. no dancing involved so far. We're so already far, six steps in. No, you're just working your way there. <laughs> this is just foreplay. Step six is 
tease, poke, wait, what? not poke. I was going to say. <laughs> poke <What>? where? <laughs> tease, pose, and spank. That was the, he says, now your partner knows something good is coming. So pose for him. He'll so find it everything sexy. else wasn't an indicator. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, the lingerie, no, it was. The it champagne. says, now your partner knows. Now your partner knows something good is coming. So now you need to pose for him. Yeah, them. He'll find <laughs> it. No, not them. It said him. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, he'll find it sexy if you spank yourself. Hmm. And uh, don't, side note here, don't let him touch you. It's all about the tease. Touch and you go. You are in control. Mm. Yeah. Step seven, but you can touch. Use your outfit or tease him with your hair. Stroke his hair with your hands. This lady had a gown and she was like rubbing the, the like belt from the gown up and down his chest or something. You know, you can touch. They can't touch. Spank yourself. They don't spank you. You know. Anyway, step eight is move and show off. To dance sexy, you need to feel sexy. You gotta lean forward and tease him with your eyes. Eye contact is so important. Your partner will find you sexy from every angle, so don't be afraid to show off your body. Todd, are you writing these down? <laughs> I have it actually cross stitched and framed here in my office. So I, I've, I've heard the, I have heard these before. All right. Step nine, <laughs> find and remember his zones. Everybody has erogenous zones, ear, the neck, round the arm. You want to blow little kisses, caress the hair around the arm. That's what it said around the arms. I'd type this down from listening to the fucking <laughs> thing. So uh, do, we, do we have some sexy music we can play behind this? Oh, we'll we find should. some. All right. Yeah, cool, we cool, cool. So yeah, blow little kisses, caress the hair, all of the zones. Make sure you hit them. Nice. The butthole zone. Final <laughs> step. <laughs> Imagine with me for a moment, if you will, <laughs> an erogenous zone full of shit. You are now in the little, zone. little kisses <laughs> around the butthole. <laughs> <laughs> you want to not like lip to lip. You yeah, want to go blow, around. Just blow it a little Tease. bit. <laughs> Tease it. <laughs> the inner cheeks, not the butthole itself. Don't eat that <laughs> ass yet. <laughs> you want to blow on it a little bit. <laughs> like and a hot spoon of soup. Uh, yeah, because step 10 is. <laughs> Step 10 is leave him wanting more. The key to a successful lap dance is the tease. Always leave him wanting more. Believe me, if you learn how to do a good lap dance, anything you want can come true. Anything. That's what it says. That's wow. what it says. Anything you that want. is quite the guarantee, ladies from Scores. Yeah. A six-figure <laughs> job with a proper 401k. Wow. Anything. Anything. <laughs> Anything I want. Healthcare, <laughs> universal <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> Woo! If you can nail down this lap dance, this 10 step <laughs> lap dance performance that we've given you for free here on Cinema Shock, all your dreams can come true. <laughs> but we have to leave them wanting more. Yeah. Let's not. You, you gotta, know. you gotta make them want more. That's the thing. For society or themselves, they need to, <laughs> they need to want more. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> at least we've we've gotten this far thank you elizabeth berkeley and your sacrifices <laughs> <laughs> she is a christ figure isn't she, <laughs> she is. she's led she, us to this she's sacrificing her, herself so that we can go commit all of our her sins. career has died for our sins <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! She's fine. She's on that new, you know, like the cock is a thing. So, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I think you're taking it wrong. Peacock. You're not wrong, Gary. Peacock. You oh, know, peacock. NBC's Peacock. I call it yeah, the yeah. cock. The cock <laughs> is a thing. So you can watch Saved by the Bell on the cock and see it. She is supposedly um. on there. <laughs> so, wow. 
All right. Just got to view it on the cock. They just bought WWE. They've got like all of the WWE archives, which means like wrestling history for the past 70 years are also. This is not a peacock advertisement. It's all on the cock. (laughs) But here's the thing about the cock having WWE with all the steroids. It's a lot shorter. All the episodes have been cut down. (laughs) They're not as powerful as they used to be. You think uh, you're joking, but they 100% have started censoring things on the, yeah. <laughs> from the Attitude Era. They've started shortening episodes and shortening segments. They're like, oh, this doesn't play so well anymore. Let's not do this. <laughs> Showgirls, you know, it may have been a failure at the time of its release, but I think it is a uh, it's kind of a testament to the power of Verhoeven's previous successes that having the film that was so heavily disliked did not put him in director's jail. Like, it... it killed the career of Elizabeth Berkeley, but it didn't really affect Verhoeven very much. Uh, you know, so, uh, but you know, he, he is, you know, he's not a, he's no dummy, Paul Verhoeven. He's a very intelligent man. So for his follow-up to Showgirls, he moved back into the tried and true genre that he'd been so successful in when he arrived in America to science fiction and the resulting film. And which is of course the subject of our next episode is possibly the director's most misunderstood film, at least maybe after Showgirls, uh, his most misunderstood, at least at the time of release. That film, of course, from 1997, talking about it on our next episode, is Starship Troopers. Uh, So we, of course, invite you guys to watch it along with us. Head to cinemashock.net. You can find links to where you can stream it or purchase it or anything. Uh, So, you know, watch along with us. These episodes are always better, I think, if you guys participate along with us. And consider this your, like, bi-weekly movie club, you know? Uh, right now, you're just chugging along on that Paul Verhoeven train. But it's, uh, we've got th- two more episodes of this series, and then we're going to move on to something else. But doesn't it feel make you feel, like, classy as fuck to be able to be like, uh, hey, man, I've watched some Romero, some Shane Black. I've been a part of this. Like, I've, yeah. I've, 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 I know what this person's uh what what's the word oeuvre Oeuvre. is yeah that's the word i was looking for oddly enough i hate it but (laughs) but uh yeah so now you're you're in the paul verhoven oeuvre and you're uh really you can analyze him as as an artist you can discuss him starship troopers spoiler alerts is one of the most perfect films ever made in my opinion. <laughs> so yeah, I am, I am all for it that we got to this far. Uh, maybe he hoped for it in Showgirls and failed, but I think he nailed it in Starship Troopers. It's, it's yeah. a five out of five for me. I'm just telling you right now in this episode, <laughs> no need to come back next week. <laughs> I'm just anyway, telling you Starship Troopers is amazing. It's great. We, so watch it along with us. Cause you're going to love it. Yeah, uh, so. we discussed it in the last uh, last season, but we're gonna we're gonna hit it harder this time and really mm. talk to you about why Starship Troopers is is fantastic. So, if you want to follow along with us, we're on social media at Cinema underscore Shock. That's where you can find us on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook or join our Facebook group on there, uh, or you can join our Discord. You can find a link to that on our website, CinemaShock.net. You can also find a link to merch and all of our old episodes. And you can find all the series like the Paul Verhoeven series with all the episodes grouped together. Uh, and that'll also have like little links to, you know, related episodes, related series and things like that. So we've got it all mapped out for you. Uh, cinemashock.net. You can find links to all of our social profiles on there, including our personal social media profiles. Speaking of which, where can you guys be found on the internet? I am at this is Gary Horn on all of the things. And I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, just a Bishop because he is holding it down on cinema shock. He is, he is really making it special. And so I just want to express my love to you, Justin Bishop. Well, thank you, Gary. I'll get, I'll, you can give me that lap dance later. I will. Well, now I have like step by step. You got to be patient with me because I'm going to read the steps as I'm going. That's okay. So, <laughs> there, there will be like moments of awkwardness, but it's going to be super hot. <laughs> Todd, where can you be found online? I am at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all of the socials. All right. And you guys can also listen to This Is Pro Wrestling and listen to Computer Resume if you want to hear these two guys talk even more than they do already on this show. <laughs> I am at Justin underscore Bishop. And, uh, you know, rate, review the show. 
share us with your friends rating and reviewing. I know we, we say that we like toss that shit off every week. Like it doesn't mean anything. Cause that's just what you're supposed to say at the end of podcast, but it legitimately does help us like get in front of people, especially reviewing. Uh, but you know, just drop a little review. It doesn't be, it could be a sentence that just says, Hey, these guys are cool. Justin is pretty hot. You know, this is a good show. Listen to it. I like that's your go-to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, and you, or, or, you know, even easier, if you know somebody who is into these types of movies and would enjoy deep diving into the history of these films, send a little text to somebody, send them a link to the show, send them a link to your favorite episode or your favorite series and, you know, spread the love. We're ready for you. We're ready. We're going to get a virtual you lap dance to, to be inside of us. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. It's weird not having anybody come on us. It is. But it you know is. What? It must one, be weird. Yeah. You know, one day we won't be doing these things on Zoom anymore, and we'll have our chance again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the audio is so much better when we're all together, but mm. you yeah. know, but it pandemic is what it is. Fucking anyway. pandemic. Yeah. So anyway, until next week, may the wings of liberty never lose a feather, and be excellent to each other. Farmer in the Dell, the farmer in the Dell. I had a cherry once and Johnny has the keys. <laughs> I hate that. Some thought into that one. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs>